So on the road. So I believe it is now recording. Is that correct? Seems, there seems to be. Okay, grand. So um, let's uh, let's get started here. All right. So uh, the, the the idea is that uh, you know six weeks, um, which will take us from the, the roots of um, Israeli military, um, you know Zionist militias through uh, the first Lebanon war. Um, some of this will be a straight narrative history, right? Who did what and when, um, but it won't all be a straight narrative history, right? We'll talk about certain events, um, but we'll, we'll also look at um, causes, at effects. Um, and, and I think one really important theme necessary to understand Zionist and subsequent Israeli history is the relationship between um, Zionism and subsequently Israel and the the great and and, and superpowers, right? Um, and and I, I think that too often there's a tendency to kind of view the um, certainly for Jews um, to to view the the situation in Israel as being kind of like a reflection of Israel or Jews or how much some thinks about Jews or whatever it be, as opposed to uh, what's often the case, which is, you know, part of part of a much larger, more complex picture in which, you know, the Zionist movement, uh, you know, and Israel are, are just, you know, sort of one piece in a much larger global strategic or diplomatic game. Um, and so with that, let us uh, let us proceed. So so let, let's go back to the magical land of Eretz Israel in the 1880s. Um, and I, I use the term Eretz Yisrael, uh, you know, self-consciously. Um, uh, Palestine was used in the region. Um, you know, we, we, we have maps from the Ottoman Empire that, uh, you know, are applied the term Palestine. Um, it was not a political term, right? There was no province of Palestine. Um, the, the area that's going to become... Palestine, mandatory Palestine, this was divided up between about like four or five different um, administrative blocks in the uh, the Ottoman Empire. Palestine was used kind of like the way that uh, the Midwest is used in the United States, right? So um, everybody would have agreed that Jerusalem was Palestine or that Hebron was Palestine. Um, when you get to the Galil, you know, it's like saying, well, everybody agrees that Wisconsin is the Midwest, you know. I've seen people refer to the Dakotas as the Midwest, but you know, in Wisconsin, we would never do that, right? So um, there, there's, there's, it, it's a, it's a term that that is uh, used. It's not a very precise term. Um, from my perspective, the 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 Jews going to Eretz Yisrael, and this is a Zionist military history uh, at the time, would have used the term Eretz Yisrael. So that seems to be as, as useful a term from for me as possible. But I also think that we we shouldn't. Um, sort of politicize language for everything, right? The fact is that Palestine was a term broadly used uh, by Europeans and Americans um, in the 19th century. Uh, Theodor Herzl used Palestine in, in their Judenstadt. Um, it's good enough for Herzl. It, it seems a bit much to argue that you know, like we should take umbrage at the use of Palestine uh, in the period. So um, I will probably avoid using it until we get to 1918, and then uh, we'll, we'll use it because it becomes a more useful political term. So 1881, the population of Eretz Yisrael was about 500,000. Um, it's based on Ottoman um, uh, census data. Um, as with a lot of things in the Ottoman Empire, it is not particularly, you know, sort of not particularly efficient or uh, accurate perhaps, but it's the best we've got. Um, if anything, uh, we undercount the number of Arabic speakers um, because the Bedouin were difficult to keep track of. Jews are pretty easy to keep track of because there was a small population and they were uh, fixed in a few places, right? Only lived in about four cities. So about 475,000 um, uh, non-Jewish Arabic speakers and about 24,000 Jews who would have been a mix of Ashkenazim and uh, and uh, Jews from the Middle East. Um and in general, Jewish life in Eretz Israel at this time was, you know, no better or worse than Jewish life anywhere uh, in the Ottoman Empire. Um, it was generally, you know, safe. Um, there were bursts of anti-Jewish violence. There was sometimes just violence because, you know, the, the place was not terribly secure. But, 
um, the the you know Jews who lived there were generally living in Jewish quarters, Jewish enclaves, where you know, with, with the exception of a kind of periodic burst of violence like occurred in Sfat in the 1840s or so, generally their lives are fairly secure. Um, and this doesn't change much during the first Aliyah. Um, th there was, from the Arabic speaker side of things, uh, occasional resentment at Jewish land acquisition. But for the first Aliyah, which runs through about 1881 until about 1903, um, even Jews who set up agricultural settlements tended to employ Arab labor, right? I mean, the, the earliest experiment with uh, with uh, uh, agricultural settlement in Eretz Israel by the Zionist uh, Rishon Lezion um, not terribly successful, right? You had a bunch of Jews who were coming from Europe, um, from the Russian Empire, where Jews did not have much experience as uh, as landowners, as farmers. A lot of them uh, are going to be students, right? People really without a lot of farming experience. Um, and they get and, and what, what experience people did have was in the very different conditions of agriculture in uh, in Russia. Right, um, and they come to Eretz Israel. They try and farm there. They can't, and a lot of cases they they ended up hiring Arab labor. So even where they took over land that had been farmed by Arabs, um, they often would hire the Arabs who were living there anyway to farm on their behalf. And this this really begins to change with the second Aliyah, and and the character of the second Aliyah. So you know. Um, Probably most of the 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 migrants during the second line were were actually urban Jews who were going to uh, Jerusalem, going to Jaffa, and then building Tel Aviv and all this stuff. But in terms of sort of like the the creation myth of of Israel, right? The the heart of the second day are the Chalutzim, um, many of whom are socialists, and they are committed not just to living and working in the land of Israel, like not just living in the land of Israel, but working in the land themselves, but doing it according to the principle of what they call the conquest of labor. And this is a big part of labor Zionism, right? Um, you know, that that we should not be exploiters, right? These are socialists. Um, they believe that it is both, uh, uh, you know, sort of a violation of sort of like socialist principles to employ Arab labor. Um, even if it benefits Arab labor, um, uh, but, but also in a matter of their idea of trying to create a new kind of Jew, right? The, the new Jew is one that goes through a lot of right, Zionist ideology. A Jew is going to be strong and self-sufficient and do work themselves, whether that means working the land or doing construction or whatever it may be. The Jew needs to do this himself, which you know, great principle. But what it means is that um, the Zionist migration in the second Aliyah, is going to lead to a lot more dispossession and uh, and, and animosity, and you know, lo long story short, to understand sort of the root of some of this problem, um, in 1858 the Ottomans had passed a new land code, and without going into all of the niceties of it, involved taxation, it involved uh, conscription, right? Uh, the, the Ottoman Empire was going through a period of reform where they wanted to um, rationalize the state and make it run more efficiently in a number of ways. Um, end result, though, is that a lot of the land in Eretz Israel came under the control and ownership of absentee landlords, right? Um, you'd have a situation where um, villages, which had never, never like a legal deed to the land, because that's not how things worked, right? This is the land your village worked, so <laughs> that's the land you farmed. But as a result of the land code of 1858, all this stuff had to be registered as private property with the state. In many cases, rich guys who had connections or bribed their way would, would gain control of land in Eretz Israel, and I assume in other places as well, um, uh, with, without living there, without having gone there, without even the sort of awareness of the people who were working the land, right? So you've got a bunch of Arab farmers, or Arabic-speaking farmers, they're working their village, and then one day, um, some Jews show up and say, right, this land is ours. So understand, from, from the, the Jews' perspective, um, this is all perfectly reasonable, right? They had a guy from the JNF who made a deal with a landowner in Jerusalem or Beirut or Damascus or whatever it is, bought, right, however many dunams of land, right, legally, all in good, and they had every right to evict um, the farmers working there, so the Jews could farm there. From the perspective of the, the locals, though, 
you've got a bunch of Jews just off the boat from Russia who've come in here waving a deed, right, from some rich landowner in uh, Damascus whom the villagers had never seen, saying that the land now belongs to them and that as a result, the villagers no longer have land to work. And this is where a lot of the, the, the animosity and, and violence begins to develop. Um, and at this point, the animosity is, is still primarily kind of an old school kind of animosity, right? There's robbery because people get robbed. Um, there's traditional animus towards Jews and these sometimes come together. Let's rob these Jews because they're weaker. Let's rob these Jews because they're unarmed. Or let's rob these Jews because they're interlopers. Um, but but there is starting um, to develop among some of the bourgeoisie in uh, in Eretz a an understanding that what they were facing uh, from the Zionist movement isn't just rich guys taking over land. It's not just you know the abuses of the landowners. There's there's something different happening here and that something different requires a different approach right over here you see on the right uh, a copy of the newspaper philistine uh philistine which which was uh begun in 1911 in uh, in jaffa sort of an early proto-palestinian nationalist paper um and it, it's 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 small but it's beginning and and in order to understand this right i have referred to local arabic speakers or arabic speakers rather than Palestinians, um, not an accident. Um, or even, or even, to, uh, even to Arabs, hold on a second. Um, sorry, dog situation. Um, so, hey buddy. <laughs> okay. So um, it's possible that all this discussion about Zionists uh, arriving and taking land, the dog got confused and uh, thought we were going to be dispossessed. He's, he's, he's very good that way. Anyway, so um, even the term Arab in this this time period is kind of uh, uh, anachronistic, right? Um, if you had asked the average Arabic speaker um, in the Middle East in the year, you know, 1881 or so, um, what are you? Most would not have said Arabs, right? Um, they would have identified by religion, Sunni or Shiite or Maronite or Jew or whatever it may be, because Jews also Arabic speakers. Um, they might have identified by uh, town, right? Uh, Kudzi or Nablusi or, you know, Rantisi or whatever it may be. They might identify by a clan, right? They're these sort of like large family groups and so forth. Um, chances are they would not have said Arab. Um, and, and Arab, even among um, Europeans, was largely a word that was used to refer to Bedouin, right? We see it as like the real Arabs. Um, nationalism is beginning, though, to seep into the Middle East. Even the term Middle East is only uh, uh, developed around, um, um, you know, uh, 1880 or so, um, right, as opposed to Near East um, or, or, you know, whatever other terms might have been used. Um, that um, nationalism is a, is a sort of ideology that begins in Europe uh, and begins to seep into the, the Middle East, um, often through Europeanized bourgeois uh, elites. And, and, and certainly there were Muslim Arabs who were uh, Arab nationalists, or what we'll call pan-Arabism, um, which was a movement that, that sought to unite the Arab world, right? Just like um, Italian nationalism had brought all the Italians together and German nationalism had brought all the Germans together. Um, Pan-Arabists wanted to create a, a, a pan-Arabic state that would bring all Arabs together, whatever an Arab may be. Um, and and that, that was a question that had to be addressed, right? There were people who said that Egyptians and other North Africans aren't actually Arabs, right? They may speak Arabic, but they're not actually Arabs. They're North Africans who were converted to Islam. Um, there were Egyptians who would have agreed with that, right? There, there were plenty of Egyptian nationalists, right? Egypt was, was already developing as an independent country by the 1820s. Um, Egypt, almost unique among the Arabic-speaking countries, had a kind of nationalist identity already and there are a number of people in the egypt who said you know what we're we're not part of the arab world right we're, we're part what's that uh, part of it in some way but we're also egyptians and that makes us special um 
many of the leading ideologists of Pan-Arabism were Christians. Anybody take a guess why that might be? Why, why do you think Christian Arabic speakers would have been particularly drawn to Pan-Arabism? And I, I would say, go back to what I said about how people would have identified themselves before the Pan-Arabist movement. Anyone give it a shot? Margie? Probably yeah. some effort for unification to try to... Okay, good, right? If you live in a world that's, if you live in a Middle East, it's defined by religion. That is a Christian, you are a perpetual minority, right? You've been a minority for, you know, the last, uh, you know, 1200 years. If you can create a new identity built around uh, national identity, right? Like you have in Europe, in which you can argue that, oh, right, look, we're all Arabs, right? Some Arabs are Sufi and some are Shiite and some are Sunni and some are Christian, Right now, you're part of the majority. Um, so Ar Arab nationalism had a number of different flavors. There was a Muslim trend of it as well. But a lot of it was this kind of like secularist um, uh, nationalism, heavily driven by, um, by Christians. Um, and, and certainly, it's fair to say at this point, there was no Palestinian nation in the 19th century. Um, and this is something which is often sort of thrown out by um, sort of more right-wing Zionists to argue that, that Palestinians are a synthetic or artificial people. Um, the fact is all nations are synthetic and artificial. Um, you know, I, I've done research into this. I found that prior to 1776, um, there was no American nation, um, found no evidence of it. There seemed to be no United States before 1776. Uh, and yet somehow or another, um, we have a lot of Americans today. Um, and this is just the nature of nationalism, right? Um, even countries which you think of like, oh, Poland and Hungary and so forth, most Poles in, you know, uh, 1900 did not see themselves as, as Poles necessarily, right? They mm -hmm. identified a bunch of different ways. Nationalism generally begins with a sort of intellectual elite, um, which then creates in institutions um, and makes great efforts to seep that identity um, down to uh, the others. But and to that extent, uh, Palestinians are no sort of different from, from any other nation. Um, and, uh, and one thing to consider is this, right? And this is one of sort of the things about unforeseen circumstances. Um, what is a nation? And again, anybody I'm happy to, anybody want to take a stab at it? What, what is a nation? What makes a group of people a nation as opposed to just a bunch of people? Common language. Okay. Good guess. Anyone else? I'm open to suggestions. Okay, well, how about this? Shared identity. Shared identity. Okay, look, anything that makes that, look, any, any group of people that thinks they're a nation are a nation, right? It could be a common language. It could be a common religion. It could be geographical proximity. It could be some combination they're in. Uh, the one I generally give to my students is any group of people who feel that they have a shared common uh, past, common identity, common future. Right, something that makes them special, something that makes them different. Right, we speak the same language more or less as Canadians, um, and yet we identify as something else. Germans speak the same language as Austrians, as a lot of Swiss, and yet different nations. Right, so a common language sometimes isn't enough. A common religion sometimes something is just a historical process that makes this group of people say we are different from this other group of people who are very similar to us. Right. And if we think of in these terms, right, in, in 1880, um, there wasn't really anything that particularly that made an Arabic speaker in the Galilee separate from an Arabic speaker 50 miles to the northeast uh, or different from a Arabic speaker 50 miles to the northwest or an Arabic speaker 50 miles to the south. Right. Um, they're all part of the Ottoman Empire. They all share a common economy common history. There's some regional variations, but, you know, all part of the same general agglomeration. But starting with the Zionist movement, and this is kind of the ironic unforeseen circumstance, a number of things are going to be happening to the Arabic speakers in this particular bit of land, right, which are ultimately going to create a identity and a set of experiences that mark them uh, in their own view and the view of other Arabs is different from all the other Arabic speakers, right? So um, while there's no Arabic nation, let's say, in, in 1880, there's no Palestinian nation in 1880. Um, there are going to be a bunch of experiences, many of them shaped by the, the, the encounter with Zionism in Israel that forge a distinct Palestinian identity, 
because they're going to go through things that no other Arabic speakers go through. Um, uh, but, but back to our story, right? 1907, a group of Khalutsim affiliated with Poel Etzion, which was one of the uh, socialist um, uh, Zionist organizations, um, establishes something called the Bar Giora Group. Um, several dozen, uh, primarily young men, who want to survey the land, right? They want to ride around the land of Israel, uh, survey the land, look for future settlements, guard settlements, and become the future nucleus or the nucleus of a future uh, Jewish army. Here is their, their slogan, in fire and blood did Judea fall, in blood and fire, right, Judea shall rise, right? Stirring stuff. Now look at, look at their clothes, okay? Uh, look at what they're wearing. Now let's look at this picture of more of them. Um, uh, these are from Hashomer, which is a, a somewhat later group, 1909, which absorbed the Bayar group and was larger. What do, what do we see when we look at their uniforms, such as they are? Right? What do they evoke? The one of, let, let's start with the one on the left, right? What, 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 what are these guys dressed like? Like, like Fedain, like, like, like Arabs. Okay, good, good, good. Right, like uh, like 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 Bedouin, like Fellahin, right? Just right, regular regular Arabs. Uh, more bizarre, look at these guys on the right. What are these guys dressed like? Like Cossacks, like oh, Russians. Okay, good. All right, so this is a real interesting thing here, and this goes back to what I was saying about um, about the idea of creating a new Jew. Um, and on often you find the language these people use. Right, it's not Jews; it's Hebrews. Right. Um, these are young men generally. Who, who are trying to create not just a new land, right? They want to create a new identity and to erase the, the exile. Um, and that means, to some extent, coming up with a new way of doing things. Um, and the model, when they looked at what they were trying to do in, uh, in Eretz Yisrael, is a model that they saw that was done by the Cossacks in the Russian Empire, specifically the Zaporozhia horde, or, or Cossacks, who had been sent by the Tsar into uh, the, the, the frontier. Small groups of Cossacks would go out into Siberia and other you know, distant places and uh, establish little settlements, which they would then defend until they grew into bigger settlements, which were self-sufficient, right? Um, and to that end, you know, it, it seemed like a pretty good role model for um, for you know, these young men. The, the irony here being, of course, they are taking on uh, images and uh, and uniforms of people who, you know, have a, their own complicated history uh, with the Jews. And again, I, there are two different groups of Cossacks. I don't think the Zaporozhia ones were the ones who generally went west um, into, into Poland and so forth. But, but still, um, they saw themselves in this same kind of romantic light. What is a Cossack? What is a Bedouin? These are free men, right? In fact, the origins of the Cossacks were, were generally like peasants and serfs and convicts and sometimes Jews who fled from uh, the Russian Empire, who fled from the Kingdom of Poland, uh, who fled from the Ottoman Empire and went into the frontier and became these sort of like uh, bands of brigands, right? Um, and, and, and that's how they wanted to see themselves, right? Or, or like the Bedouin, right? Free men who are... Um, living under nobody's rules but their own. Um, it ties in with their sort of romantic Zionist views of their relationship with the land. Um, they're going to be, but what, what is the Jew in Gullahs? He is, he is the product of hyper-civilization. Um, what they're going to do is go back to nature. And for them, the Bedouin, the Cossack, these were men who were not just free and tough, but they were connected to nature in a way that the Jews weren't and in a way that these um, right young men want, want to connect to. Yeah. Um, now, um, as the name suggests, right, Hashemir's job is basically to serve as guards, right? Agricultural settlements are being established. Um, uh, and the fact is that um, no matter what, what dreams they have of creating their own Jewish army, um, all this is pretty hindered by the fact that the Yishuv, right, is still under the rule of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is not interested in giving them territory to the Zionists. It's not interested in arming the Zionists. It's not interested in having problems in which, um, you know, 
autonomous Jewish militias are fighting with local Muslims. So there's a limit to what a group like Hash America can actually do, but on a good day, at least, it can keep Jews from being attacked. Um, but with the outbreak of the Great War in 1914, and particularly in November 1914, when the Ottoman Empire enters the war, um, the Ashuv is faced with both crisis and opportunity. So uh, here is a map of, um, uh, of the combatants. And as I noted, right, the, the Ottomans enter on the side of the, uh, the, the central powers. What is, what is the crisis for the members of the Ashuv? What do you think? Mm -hmm. well, how about this? Where, where did most of the Yeshuv, Nikki, where did most of the Jewish uh, migrants come from? Russia, Eastern Europe. Okay, good. Yeah, the Russian Empire. So um, most of them, therefore, are now, right, enemy combatants. They're not non-combatants, sorry, enemy non-combatants, right? Um, they are citizens of a hostile state. Um, and so um, with the exception of the relatively small number who actually had taken Ottoman citizenship or been living there beforehand, um, there, there is a, a mass migration of Jews out of Eretz Yisrael, right? So there's an immediate demographic decline um, because, again, a lot of the Jews living there were not Ottoman citizens. Um, but where do you think the opportunity is going to come? Ottomans needed soldiers. Oh, well, here's the thing. Everybody needs soldiers. The opportunity is not going to come to the Ottomans, though. Opportunity is going to come from the British, right? Um, the, the, the feeling here is like, look, the Ottomans own the land. People don't give up the land that they own. Um, the British want to take the land, um, right? Uh, and maybe now you have an opportunity if you throw your support to the British, um, that you could end up on the winning side of a war that sees the Ottomans uh, being forced to make concessions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, Ottomans, sorry, Zionists both inside and outside the Yishuv uh, are going to offer their services to the British Empire, um, right? Because they, they see this as a, as a literally once in a lifetime chance to change the status quo in Palestine in a way that you couldn't imagine before, right? The fact is, for all of Herzl's dreams, um, there's no way you're going to convince the Ottomans to cede land uh, to, right, the Zionists. Uh, the British, right, maybe something could be done. Um, so you had, uh, first of all, in, uh, in Eretz Yisrael, hold on a second, more dog cobs, Eliza. So I don't know if he wants water or something, but he's, uh, he's, he's got some issues. Sorry. Um, You've got aspiring uh, Neely, uh, which is a uh, abbreviation for Netzach Yisrael Lo Yishaker, uh, also the name of uh, uh, Nisim Ars in Israel. Um, uh, right, the, the eternal one of Israel, uh, right, does not lie. Right, so these were a group of uh, of young Ashuv that came again. They were, um, they were uh, had been from the Russian Empire, but they had become Ottoman citizens, um, and they offer their services to the British, right? N nothing major, right? Reporting on troop movements, reporting on, um, you know, uh, wh where Ottoman gun positions were and so forth. Um, uh, yeah, for, for, for a year or so, We're they... Sorry, uh, I won't get your call, but please leave a message and look at that. He was quickly as possible. Uh, Ima? Thank you for calling. Ima? Okay. All right. Uh, I know it's probably a violation of some halacha for me to mute my mother, um, but I, I, I'll deal with that on Yom Kippur. Anyway, so um, Neely Wright provided uh, uh, spy information. Eventually, some of the leaders were caught and executed. Um, uh, more well known and then probably ultimately more significant uh, for for our ongoing story are, are are Jews who had served in the British military. So a lot of Jews had ended up in Egypt, right? So they were expelled from uh, the Ottoman Empire. Egypt was the the closest place if you were in Palestine to um, to to go to, which was again a nominally an independent country, but in real terms under uh, control as a British protectorate. Um, and two in particular, a guy named uh, Joseph Trimpledor and Zev Jepatinsky, begin to petition the British for permission to form a unit of Jewish soldiers. Um, uh, both were from the Russian Empire, 
um, which again, ally of Britain at this point. Jabotinsky was a highly decorated combat soldier um, who had served in the Russian army during the, uh, the Russo-Japanese War. Um, uh, he had, you know, lost his arm uh, and then, you know, <laughs> you know, announced that he still had one more arm to give to the Tsar and then went back into combat. He was the, uh, the uh, if I understand correctly, the first um, uh, Jewish soldier promoted to an officer rank in the Russian army. Um, right, and you can, if you look at the picture, you can see his, his left arm is uh, sort of a dummy there. Um, and, and Jabotinsky, Jabotinsky was a journalist. He had helped organize um, uh, Jewish self-defense groups in, I think, Odessa during the uh, the pogroms in the earlier part of the century during the 1904 revolutions. Um, both of them saw this as an opportunity to demonstrate, uh, number one, Jewish courage, and Jewish, Jewish martial ability and military skills and so forth. So some of this is part of that regular Zionist sort of desire. But, but there's also a larger thing here, too, which we're going to see in, in World War II as well, right? This idea that if you know, if we provide services to the victorious powers, we will have a say when this war is over, right? We will have a place at the table when uh, it's time to discuss, um, you know, what should be done or, or who should get a share of this land. Um, end result are two units. Uh, one is the Zion Mule Corps, um, which is a non-combat unit made up of, uh, of Jews from, uh, from Eretz Israel who uh, are part of the logistics force that they said to Gallipoli. Um, some of you may be familiar with that, a, a group of, of primarily Australian and New Zealand troops with um, some British soldiers as well are sent to uh, uh, the, the mouth of the uh, Dardanelles or the Sea of the Bosporus, excuse me, um, to try and uh, enforce a quick end to the war with the Ottoman Empire. Turns out to be a disaster, but the 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 Zionists acquitted themselves well. And then eventually Jabotinsky hawks the British enough to be able to form a, um, a unit, uh, a combat unit within the British army um, made up of both uh, Jews from Eretz Roll, some Jews from the Russian Empire who'd left, um, by that point, the Russian Empire is out of the war, and some British Jews. Um, uh, it, was, it, it was known colloquially as the Jewish Legion, or still known to Jews as the Jewish Legion, but it was actually part of a you know, sort of regular British army unit. Um, and with the war over, um, the, uh, the Yeshuv now has the blessing of the British mandate, right? So um, Great Britain has formally pledged and not just formally pledged, but been sort of um, uh, authorized by the League of Nations to build a Jewish national home in Eretz Israel, or whatever exactly Jewish national home is. Um, uh, and, and the British are expecting, right, that that their regular imperial playbook will work, right? They had an extensive global empire. They assumed that the Arabs here would be docile um, uh, as, as natives were in other places, but um, the, the, the times were changing. Um, there is a, a spate of anti-Jewish violence uh, by the Arabs in the early 1920s, including the fighting in Northern Israel that leads to the death of Trumpledore. Um, and the British, uh, are in many ways a broken empire, right? Um, they do not have the desire to expend much blood and treasure um, in, in order to maintain a control over uh, the Palestine mandate. Um, and what we're going to find in the interwar period is that the British government generally is, you know, willing to assist the Yishuv and does provide valuable assistance to them, um, but is often uh, going to, you know, take steps backwards when confronted by Arab intransigence, because it beats the alternative of more money and more troops and more problems in the Arab world. Um, and the Ashuv leadership decides they need to create a, a new and larger, more organized military organization, uh, which will be called the Haganah. Um, and, and, and like Hashomer, right, what does the name Haganah suggest? What does it mean? Yeah. Defense. Yeah. Okay. Good. The, the Haganah, right from the the root, um, right having to do with defense, is a shield. Right is is largely seen as a defensive organization. Right. Hold hold that thought. Um, we'll address it again. Um, designed to protect the Yishuv. Um, and again, there is a British military. There is a British police force. Right. Um, uh, you know, in the best of days, the Haganah doesn't have to protect the Jews because right the British are doing that 
you know, for them. Um, and the Haganah is given a certain amount of leeway by the British because it is connected to the Jewish agency. It's sort of seen as the responsible Jewish organization. Uh, but through the 1920s, it, it's not very well armed, not very well organized. Um, and then there's a new outbreak of violence in 1929. Um, uh, and the Haganah decides it needs to arm itself and organize itself better, uh, and some decides to break away from the Haganah because it's too passive and form their own group. Um, this would be called Haganah Bet, um, which rejects the principle of Havlaga, which is self-restraint. Um, ultimately, this will go through a couple of different variations before by the mid-30s. It's morphed into something called the Urgun, which we'll speak more about later. Um, over here on the left, you have the founder of Haganah Bet, um, Avram Tahomi, uh, who is the founder of Haganah Bed, and, and a, some years earlier, 1924, the, the probable assassin of a guy named, named Jacob Dahan. Um, Dahan was one of these sort of weird figures, uh, intellectual figures the Jewish world uh, produced <laughs> sort of before the Holocaust, uh, who go through like this full range of ideological permutations. Um, back in the Netherlands, he had been a uh, a, an author of autobiographical homoerotic um, uh, literature. Um, he eventually becomes an ardent Zionist by the 1920s. He is a, a ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionist activist and writer of autobiographical homoerotic literature, um, which, uh, you know, right, God, 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 God bless the world. I say God bless America. This is not America. But yeah, there, 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 there have been thoughts that he might have been killed by um, by uh, it, some Arab men who were upset or had a lover's quarrel, whatever it may be. It seemed later on that he was assassinated by uh, uh, Tahomi for his, uh, his anti-Zionist uh, activities. Um, Tahomi is later on going to return to the Haganah, um, bringing many of his followers with him. But, but eventually, this group that he formed will become the Irgun Sfailumi, the National Military Organization, which is going to be the military wing of the of the revisionists, which is uh, Jabotinsky's organization, and uh, what what are anybody you know recognize what it is you see? This is the Irgun sort of uh, logo. What, what what you see here on the flash? Some of you may be familiar with it anyway. It's uh, it's a map showing all of what Jabotinsky believed was promised to the Jews, um, which was not just the land west of the Jordan River, but the land east of the Jordan River as well, which had been made Transjordan, right? It was uh, a, a stable belief of the revisionists that the, the Zionist movement was entitled to all of that land, right? Eretz Israel, right? Uh, and the, the Transjordan area. Um, it's got a hand clutching a rifle um, superimposed over all of what they considered to be Palestine with the words Rakach, only fuss. Right, which again sort of harkens back to that idea of like only through violence, only through you know uh, militarism will we reclaim our land. Um, Jabotinsky had been expelled from Eretz Yisrael, uh, uh, Palestine in the early 1920s for his efforts to arm Jews and fight Arabs, um, but he had established his own Zionist organization, a militant youth group called Beitar, uh, which is an, a, an international organization with branches in a, in, in a, in a lot of countries. Um, which is designed to sort of train up a new generation of uh, Zionist uh, revisionist youth, militant Zionist revisionist youth. Um, the, the biggest um, Beitar movement was, uh, was also where the biggest revisionist movement was, which was Poland. Uh, by 1939, the leader of Beitar in Poland was uh, this guy over here, uh, Menachem Begin, uh, with hair. Right there, he's there. Um, uh, uh, who, had, who, had, who had, you know, was a trained lawyer. He'd worked for Beitar in uh, Czechoslovakia and now had taken over the, the largest there. And it's worth looking at the, the uniforms, right? This was a militant organization. I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, and, and it was one of many throughout the world at this point, right? And I, 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 I am not saying this to suggest that there is uh, some kind of, you know, uh, particular connection between the Zionist revisionists and the fascists, all political groups in Europe had these kinds of young men's organization, um, engage in street fighting, engage in brawling, engage in political organizing. 
um, left and right all had these 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 groups. Um, and um, it, it's it's worth pointing out a sort of interesting thing, right? Uh, today, for quite a while, anti-Semitism uh, and Zionism uh, are seen as antagonistic. But from the start, Herzl viewed like um, anti-Semites as a useful ally for the Zionist movement, right? Why would that be? Okay, they both want the same thing, right? They want the Jews out of Europe, right? Yeah. Um, and and he wasn't necessarily wrong about this, right? I mean, and, and in fact, you, know, you do have uh, some at times significant um, alliances made between um, Zionist organizations and anti-Semitic organizations or governments in Europe. Um, in Poland, both the revisionists and the uh, Polish regime um, uh, wanted the Jews out of Poland. Um, uh, the Polish government uh, from 1935 on had this kind of you know, we might say say sort of fantastical, um, but but you know, if you can will it, it is no dream idea that you would have some facilitate a mass migration of Polish Jews to uh, Palestine with the blessing and support and help of the Polish government. Um, they would create then a, a a Jewish state in the Middle East, which would not only get rid of Poland's Jews, right, but actually be a kind of um, uh, uh, foothold in the Middle East for Poland, right? Poland was having its own sort of like imperialist or great power games here. Um, and the Poles provided training to the, uh, the Zionist revisionists, right? A military training, uh, weapons training, right? All this sort of stuff there. Because um, again, uh, Jabotinsky was seen as somebody who they could work with. Um, the fact that Jabotinsky was not a, a socialist or a communist, um, uh, as a lot of the the you know Zionists were, certainly made him a, a more likely ally to the extremely anti-communist um, Polish government. Um, and uh, it wasn't just the Polish government, right? In, in Italy, uh, Mussolini had uh, allowed the revisionists to set up a naval training station at Civitavecchia, right? This is uh, uh, in Southern Italy, um, uh, where the Italians had a naval training station. Um, you see here the uh, the boat that the uh, the um, revisionists were using to train a cadre of Zionist sailors. Um, Jabotinsky himself was, uh, was uh, he was an Anglophile. He also was a great uh, uh, admirer of, of, of Italy in general. He loved Italy, but he also um, was an admirer of Mussolini, which again, I, I, I in the 1920s and 1930s, hardly alone, right? The fact is that that Churchill was in Mar of Mussolini, FDR was in Mar of Mussolini, and it, it's not relevant to the discussion today. But I, to me, it's interesting. You know, if Mussolini had died in a plane crash in the beginning of 1935, right, he would be remembered by historians as one of the great political figures of the 20th century. Um, if Mussolini died in a plane crash beginning of 1935 or end of 1934, he would be remembered as the guy who saved um, Italy from communists, who built the Italian economy, who unified Italy as it never done before, who built Italian industry, and most importantly, um, in 1934, had prevented a Nazi takeover of Austria. Um, Right, who would have been a, remembered as a completely different figure. So you know, you have a, uh, a school of thought which sort of tries to make whatever connections they can between Zionism and fascism and Nazism, and looks at the Jabotinsky uh, Mussolini connection as you know damning evidence. Um, uh, I, I, I would point out, like very, you're right. If you look at the context of the 1930s, up until 1938, even. Um, right, very, very different uh, experience. Or Mussolini was was perceived by most as a as a very different figure than he's going to be after 1938. Um, all right, um, and all that training, all that planning, training and planning in Palestine, training and planning in um, Poland are going to be put to the test uh, in in Palestine. Right, 1936 had been a big year for Arab nationalism, um, general strikes and demonstrations. Uh, led Britain to agree to withdraw troops from most of Egypt, uh, except for the Canal Zone. France had agreed to a plan for uh, Syrian independence. Um, again, they drag it out, but you know, agreed. Um, and and in Palestine, um, you have a growing 
Palestinian Arab leadership that is trying to harness um, antagonism to the British, antagonism to Zionism, this general anti-European feeling uh, to try and accomplish great things in Palestine as well, particularly an end to Jewish immigration. And it's worth looking at the numbers. And the fact is, Arab concerns about the rising Jewish population aren't uh, aren't absurd or aren't un, un, unreasonable, right? The fact is, um, you know, particularly in the 1930s, right? After the rise of Hitler, after the, 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 the death of Marshal Polzutsky in Poland, which led to a more openly anti-Semitic government in Poland, um, the, the depression in France, the fact that America closed its doors in 1924, um, Jews wanted to get out of Europe, didn't have too many options available to them. Um, and those who could, in increasing numbers, are going to Palestine, um, including, again, uh, some 50,000 or so who do so, uh, again, with the uh, sort of collaboration of the Zionist uh, movement, right, the Jewish agency and, uh, and the Nazi government in Germany. Um, and the Arabs are looking at a real rising tide of Jewish immigration. Um, and you can see the numbers there. Uh, at the same time, 1935 is also when the uh, the depression finally hits Palestine. Up until 1935, the economy there wasn't necessarily doing so badly. So this combination of larger population, uh, fewer job opportunities, right, tight economic conditions, leads to a general strike and demand for an end to Jewish immigration. Um, and and the strike sort of touched off. Uh, a new round of violence. Um, there had been a previous round of violence a year earlier in 1935, um, a, uh, a, a shipment of cement being unloaded in Jaffa had, had, had like a crate or a, actually a barrel, I think it was, had broken open and inside the, the barrel wasn't cement, it was machine guns for the Haganah, um, which sparked a, a wave of, of anti-Jewish violence. This guy is, uh, 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 what's his name, is Abdin uh, Al-Qassam. Some of you may be familiar with the Al-Qassam name, um, who is uh, the leader of the Young Men's Muslim Association sort of thing in, uh, in uh, uh, Haifa. He had led a small uprising against the British, um, not very successful, and got him killed. But his death became sort of a rallying cry, um, which, which led to the Arab Revolt. Um, and the Arab Revolt is going to lead to several important and noteworthy military developments in the struggle over Palestine. One is the militarization of the Haganah. Um, right, so again, the Haganah had been around since 1920, uh, had been tolerated to some extent by the British, um, but, but the fact that they still need to smuggle guns in in barrels of cement points to the fact that it's still an unofficial official militia. But with the Arab revolt, the British are faced with a immediate crisis. Um, they don't have a lot of manpower in Palestine. They don't want to have to spend a lot of money uh, in Palestine, right? They're suffering their own depression. Um, and, uh, and starting by the late 1930s to begin a rearmament um, in the face of rising German aggression. Um, and uh, they're looking for right, reliable forces in Palestine, and they look to the, the issue. Um, and they begin to establish several auxiliary forces in Hebrew, known as the Notrim, um, like the the Jewish settlement police, the Jewish supernumerary police. Right? These are these are armed uh, police officers um, who are given training. They're given weapons. Uh, it's generally understood by the British that most of these people are members of the Haganah. Right? The Haganah encouraged their members to join to receive the weapons and training. And, and the British are okay with this now because uh, they need the help. And you look over here. Um, there a number of very important figures in Israeli military history are going to begin their real training under these organizations. There's uh, Moshe Dayan, there's um, Yitzhak Sadeh, there's, I think, Yigal Alon, um, right? So, uh, right, the, the Haganah begins to become a real uh, military organization. Um, the establishment of their good is a rival to the Haganah. Right, so just as the Haganah is kicking into high gear, but still practicing restraint, right, what they call Havlaga, um, under a new leader, David Raziel, the Irgun um, embraces a full offensive policy against the Arabs. Um, right, uh, in, in 
some sometimes spectacular and grotesque ways, right? Uh, which brings us to the third thing, the introduction by the Ergon of modern terrorism into Palestine. And I, I, I use the term modern very carefully here, right? This is often, again, a criticism that's made against the Zionists. Like, oh, they introduced terrorism in the Middle East. Um, terrorism existed, right? Traditional terrorism is a tool of the strong against the weak, right? If you are a majority, Right. If you're a group of white Americans who want to lynch blacks, if you're a group of, uh, you know, Ukrainians who want to pogrom Jews, if you're a group of Muslims who want to slaughter Jews. Right. Um, that's terrorism. Right. You're able to do that because you can go into the town or the shtetl or the Jewish quarter and kill whomever you want to kill because you control the institutions of state, because you're the majority, because you have the weapons, whatever it may be. Modern terror, by contrast, is, is a tool of the minority against the majority. It's a tool of the weak against the strong, right? Modern terror is bombing. Modern terror is drive-by shootings, right? Uh, the, the Jews in 1937, 1938 are not in a position to right, charge into the Arab quarter um, uh, or an Arab village and just, you know, assault the Arabs. What they can do is set off bombs um, in marketplaces. What they can do is throw grenades in school buses. Um, they can drive by and shoot up a, uh, a bus stop, uh, you know, full of Arabs. And, and the, the tactic they adopt is basically this. As far as they're concerned, they want to demonstrate, number one, that Jewish blood is not cheap um, and that uh, there's a price to pay for it um, and that the Jews are going to fight. And so um, what they do basically is when there is an attack from uh, a, an Arab village or an Arab neighborhood uh, or building uh, with, on Jews, they will target that village or that neighborhood not to kill um, the people who committed the attack on Jews, because they don't know who those are, but to kill other Arabs in that neighborhood or village as a warning that right, this is what happens, right? You shoot up a Jewish neighborhood, right? We will set off a bomb in an Arab movie theater. Um, and you've got to decide if you want to control, uh, you know, your violent young men, um, which you can say it's justified, neither here nor there, uh, but, but certainly terrorism. Um, and, and this very important, the development of the special night squads. So um, at this point, you had a pipeline connecting from, uh, from Iraq to Haifa, pumping Iraqi oil, right, to British freighters uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, and that pipeline was coming under Arab attack. Um, in Palestine at the time is a British officer by the name of Ord Wingate. Uh, some of you may have heard of him. Um, the, the British military in this period is, is, a, is a weird sort of mix. On the one hand, you've got these, and this has been the case through the Victorian okay. era. Where the British military always attracted this weird mix of sort of like very hidebound professionals, uh, gifted amateurs, uh, and kind of mad geniuses. Uh, and, you know, various combinations uh, there in Wingate was kind of, you know, sort of the, you know, mad genius type. Um, he was a uh, from a military family, administrative family, um, Christian Zionist, a uh, member of a particular group called the, 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 the Plymouth Brethren, um, who's while he's stationed in Palestine, sees um, himself as playing a role in the, you know, sort of the, the events leading up to the second coming, right? He is going to help the Jews return to the land and recontrol the land and so forth. Um, and he receives permission from the British authorities to establish special groups of soldiers whom he is going to train and lead uh, against the, uh, the Arabs who threaten um, the, the, the oil pipeline. Um, uh, he is an early advocate of what today we call commando warfare, um, World War II, he's going to be involved in, uh, in, in creating a number of commando forces with varying degrees of success. That's a matter of another conversation. Again, also a bit of an eccentric. He was a nudist, um, he used to eat raw onions. Um, and, uh, and this, I think, is a brilliant thing. Ord Wingate, when he later became a general, when he had to have a meeting, at the beginning of every meeting, he would set a, 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 an alarm clock for 25 minutes. He said no meeting should ever last longer than 25 minutes. Hail to Ord Wingate. Anyway, he trains these young young soldiers or turns these young men into soldiers. Um, and not just soldiers, but commandos, right? He, he places a great stress on, on being fast, on being fierce, on being brutal if necessary. They train to fight at night. 
They train to do ambushes. They train to do counter ambushes. Um, and again, not coincidental that you look at guys like Kigal Alon and Moshe Dayan. Um, they served in the special night squads, right? When you look at the development of um, Israeli tactics and professionalism um, and its doctrine in terms of how small groups or even a small country, right, needs to fight its wars, um, right, uh, some of that at least is coming out of the experience of Wingate and the special night squads. Um, and as a footnote, uh, the British also during this uh, period are going to leave behind uh, some institutions which are going to play a big role in, in later wars, Taggart Forts. Right? This is one of the things the British decide in order to get control over um, this territory, we're going to build these police forts, station police units uh, in high ground all over the country to keep an eye on air villages and if there's an attack to respond quickly. Um, a lot of these are gonna become um, important uh, battlegrounds uh, because again, they're built on high ground, they're good fortified positions um, uh, in, in both 48 and in 67. Anybody recognize this building over here? Some of you may have been there. Akko? Uh, not Akko. Um, yeah. Wrong, wrong fort, a couple, couple thousand years too late. Um, it's the, uh, the tank museum at Latrum. Uh, oh. which, uh, which was built by the British as a Taggart fort, taken over by the uh, Transjordanians in and, uh, and 48 and fought over in 48 and 67. Um, now, um, the, by 39, the air revolt has been suppressed. Um, uh, 39, there was a complicated year for the Yeshuv and its relationship to the British. Um, uh, the British issue their white paper, right, which severely restricts uh, further Jewish immigration to Palestine. Um, it, it seems to be a betrayal of uh, the Balfour Declaration. It certainly is a betrayal of, uh, of Zionist hopes uh, for what Palestine would become. Uh, but at the same time, World War II breaks out. Uh, most Zionists accepted what Ben-Gurion said. Right, we'll fight the white papers if there was no war, and fight the wars if there's no white paper because they recognize a victory for Hitler is no bueno for Los Judeos. Um, uh, did I get that right, Josh? Is that is that good Spanish? Um, uh, but not everyone in the issue have agreed, right? And and here we have the last of the pre-war of the pre-independence militias, Avram Stern, uh, who'd been a Gunist. Um, rejected Jabotinsky's call to support the British war effort. Um, uh, Stern is, again, one of these guys' complex array of ideas. Uh, he, viewed the Israel, he viewed the Zionist struggle against uh, for independence as being part of a larger anti-imperialist struggle in which he hoped to sort of make alliance with the Arabs. Um, he forms the Lochme Harut Israel, right, the, the fighters for the, uh, the freedom of Israel. AKA Lehi or the Stern Gang, as the British called it. Um, and uh, he is a committed Hebrew nationalist who, uh, even uh, as late as early 1941, actually tries to make an alliance with the Germans. Um, right? He puts out feelers to uh, some, some German agents to say that, listen, you guys want to defeat the British. We also want to defeat the British um, in exchange for uh, recognizing a Right, Jewish state after the British are defeated, we're willing to throw our support to you. Um, again, this is a time where the British are fighting in North Africa, as well as other places. Um, the Germans report this back to the authorities. Nothing much happens. They don't respond to Stern, and Stern himself is killed by our uh, British police later on in the year. Um, but it you know, highlights sort of, again, the, the distance he was willing to go. Um, but like World War I, this is a crisis and an opportunity. It's a crisis because the Yishuv is threatened, um, uh, you know, when, when the uh, Rommel is uh, advancing in Egypt, there are all kinds of, you know, sort of desperate plans for the Yishuv. There's talk about going to the Carmel Mountains and building fortifications and, right, the Jews will make a, you know, sort of desperate last stand and fight a guerrilla war against the, uh, the Germans. Um, thankfully, it doesn't happen. But again, the British, much more than in World War I, are going to recruit heavily from the Yishuv. Um, they need the manpower. Um, and in the Middle East, the Yishuv is really the only source of reliable manpower, right? Because most of the Arabs uh, would want to see a British defeat. Um, so, um, right, they're willing to take whatever help the Yishuv can offer. And, and across the board, right, from left wing to right wing, um, 
everybody participates, right? Um, uh, the Ergun, Ergun is joined, right? David Raziel is killed in uh, 1941 conducting operations in Iraq. Uh, Moshe Dayan lost his eye during uh, campaigns against Vichy Syria. Um, the uh, British allowed the creation of the Palmach, um, which is sort of like the Haganah's response to the, the Irgun, right? The Palmach is supposed to be like the strike force, the offensive branch of uh, the Haganah. And again, especially as the Germans are advancing, um, uh, they get funding and training from the British. A lot of the people serve are again members of the Special Night Squads because again, the British are expecting they're gonna need these guys uh, if the Germans break through. Um, but, but probably more important than the ones who serve in the militia are that, um, a large number, maybe 30,000 uh, Yeshuv Nikim, um, uh, are going to uh, serve in some capacity or another in the British military, right? Um, th that's a big number, 600,000 people in the Yeshuv. Um, a lot of them serve in support roles. So again, as we're going to see in 1948, those support roles are going to be hugely important. Um, there are also Jews that are serving in combat arms and most famously the Jewish Brigade. But by the end of World War II, there are going to be uh, certainly Jews in general around the world, but Yeshuv Nikim, who have experience as tankers, have experience as pilots, who have experience as infantrymen in modern warfare, right? Not, not small arms encounters, not clashes with militias, um, but, but actual intense combat, artillerymen, um, supply guys too, all of which is extremely important. Um, by the spring of 1945, um, the Yeshuv's war against the Germans was over, um, but their war against the British had just begun. Dun, dun, dun. And we'll pick up next week. And I am going to say, I plan this, not coincidentally, that, uh, you know, uh, next week, our class on the War of Independence will take place on May 15th, the day that the, uh, the uh, British mandate ended. Um, and with that, I'm happy to open the floor to uh, questions, comments, concerns. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Very thorough. Just like yeah, my students really ask beautiful. nothing now, but right before the test, you're going to be bombarding my email box. <laughs> okay. 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 All right, guys. Thank, Thank you, David. Fabulous, as always.